you know why she'd taken a creativity class where we'd be improvising. She thought she'd made a horrible mistake. Well, partly through the quarter, we were doing some improvisations, and she had drawn some some pr provocations for an improvisation out of a hat. And all of a sudden, the shy woman who had never spoken in class, she had this six foot tall man in a headlock and was pretending she was robbing him in a bank and she was screaming and getting everybody to lay on the ground and she she completely surprised herself and she wrote in her journal that night, I was physically and mentally open for anything to come my way. I have to say I was I am sorry, I was pretty astonished with myself. The class enjoyed it and I felt that I wasn't judged by them at all. In my honest opinion, I believe that this night was a dis defining moment for me. I felt it as I was leaving the class. It was a feeling of sureness, freedom, and being optimistic about me. And when I was thinking about our topic tonight, I thought to me this in many ways is really a description of what empowerment feels like and the spaces we create that can make room for that. So I'm going to leave. I know my uh, the, the music is playing on here. I do want you to know you, you've all got uh, in front of you uh, a paper that's an invitation. We're, we're doing it at the School for New Learning at, at the center I oversee. learning agility that you're all invited to. There's no charge, but you do have to register. So there's information um, on this pamphlet, uh, or the, the handout you have, and there's some outside. But also, we're doing a two-day intensive on April 23rd and 24th, where you can learn more about how to develop these capacities and also how to help others develop these capacities. And all of that information is on the website. Thank you for indulging a brief PR. Oh, yes. Oh, it's awesome. Okay, thank you, Pamela. Next up is Sol. And um, in 2002, Sol became the founding executive director of La Casa Senorque, a community based organization whose mission is to serve youth and families confronting homelessness. Since opening its doors, La Casa Norte has helped more than 20,000 homeless and at risk individuals by offering access to stable housing and delivering comprehensive services. They've acted as a catalyst to transform lives and our neighborhoods. So please help me to welcome Sol. Uh, I just want to say thank you for having me tonight. And I want to apologize in advance. I have to leave a little bit early because I had another um, engagement. But I do want to have the opportunity to share my story and the work that I do with you. And my contact information is available. So for students who want to talk or just keep the discussion alive, I encourage you to um, reach out to me. Uh, and we can chat about anything you like. Um, but in terms of um, the context tonight where we're talking about women's empowerment, I would just like to start with my own story, which is a trajectory of how I'm here today on March 6th. So here we go. To T, Felita Matilde Rosa. So these are the women who I've literally come from. This is a line of five strong Afro-Puerto Rican women that come and were bred in Puerto Rico and made their way to Chicago in the 1950s. And this is the household that I grew up with. And this is the beginning. These are the women that shared with me the idea of what is familia and what is politics. And so my grandmother, who ne Matilde, who never learned how to speak English, and who I'm sad to say probably did not make every election, <laughs> uh, so she didn't make it to the ballot box, taught me truly what is the act of politics and how that comes out in community and in family. Matilde, who bore seven children uh, and came to the United States uh, with an eighth grade education, understood how important it was for women to, to be the head of the household, to be head of family, and to teach children and give children the opportunity to really be warm and embrace in their culture. Uh, she was recruited, my grandmother, to be one of the very first Latino foster care families and mothers in the state of Illinois in the 1970s. Uh, and there was a big lawsuit which said if you're going to remove uh, children from the home, you have to place them into culturally appropriate homes. 
So my Matilda signed up for this, and over the course of 20 years, uh, she fostered over 200 children and ended up, up adopting four more. And we grew up in this six-unit tenement building on Armitage Avenue in Lincoln Park before DePaul <laughs> changed that community. There were Puerto there were black people in DePaul. <laughs> in, in the community, in Lincoln Park is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, but we grew up in this tenement building, and all of us lived like a tribe, and you'd wake up in the morning, and there'd be a new primo to play with. And it was children taking care of children. And that was the environment that I grew up, and that was the act of politics. And that was community development, and that was caring for others. And that got transcribed down to my mother and the work that she made available for me and opportunities that she made available to me. Um, my mother is not college educated, uh, yet growing up in the, in the 1960s, uh, she is a self-prescribed, uh, self-described hippie. Uh, so my name is Sol Amores. Uh, and for those of you who don't speak Spanish, it is literally sun loves and flores is flowers. So I had nothing to do with it. I just showed up 40 years ago and she said, that's you. Uh, and uh, that was also, so I share that with you because from the beginning, uh, she had this role model in her mother and in her lines of grandmothers, but coming and living in this city, she really wanted to break out of the stereotypical um, identities that were in place for uh, black Puerto Ricans in the 1960s and 70s and what it meant for her to be raising a child. Um, and so she went out of her way to create opportunity for me um, to have strong mentorship, to have strong exposure to other things inside of my community, inside of our culture, uh, what it means to be Puerto Rican, what it means to be Latina, but also exposure to other communities, right, and why this was so important and continuously uh, instilled in me the opportunity for, again, what is political. Um, in the organization that I work for, one of the things that we always do um, is a, a practice and an exercise around what are our values, right, and our personal values. And I share the story uh, that my uh, key personal value is justice and doing what's just and, and right. And I got really clear about that when I was 13 years old, and I was clear, and I said to my mother, I am pro-choice. And she said, that's good. And I said, well, I have to do something about that. And she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm going to join the junior board of NOW, the National Organization for Women, and I'm going to get a group of women my age to go to DC. And she said, sure. <laughs> uh, and so I, I share my story of justice and the opportunity of what it meant for five 13-year-olds to get on a bus and go to DC. And you know, you guys know that trip, right? You march all day, you get back on the bus, and come home, right? Uh, but again, um, getting the act of what is politics, what is community, what is contributing to others, uh, and the strong sense of mentorship and modeling that I got. My um, first job out of college uh, was in a for-profit sector. I worked for a company called PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I was a management consultant. Uh, and um, I was the only Latina that I ever met in my team ever, uh, and I was one of maybe three brown people, and I'm not including Southeast Asians, I'm really talking about Latinos and, and African Americans, and I can't tell you how many times in that culture uh, and in my experiences, I was asked if I was a secretary, I was asked to make copies, I was asked to get water, uh, and it doesn't matter that I'm a University of Chicago graduate, right? So I share that with you again, the experience of identity and who I looked to and who was a savior for me was um, a woman. So I had the opportunity to be mentored by a very strong uh, female director at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, who I've known over, of course, the last 17 years. And uh, through all that work, has come back to, to now be on the board of directors of La Casa Norte, the organization that I work with, so it's really great. Uh, you, read a, you heard a little bit about the work that I do. I encourage you to go to our website and learn about our mission. But the most important thing about the work uh, that La Casa Norte does is the establishment of strong family opportunities. So giving moms who are in a housing crisis the opportunity to be strengthened, to become whole by having a home, in turn creates opportunity for her children to then have normalization and have adult mentorship, right? So same experiences that I had when I was young and it was obvious that this was this village raising me, there was a strong women, it didn't matter that you're working poor, it didn't matter your education was, that the women who we serve have the opportunity to do that. Um, the work that we do with young people, again, 
very key to understanding uh, a normalization and adult mentorship that they can get beyond my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Tonight I need to eat, I need to sleep, and I need clothes, and then what's next? How do I, how do I grow? How do we create strong social-emotional relationships? How do I get to understand working with men and women beyond all the images uh, that are projected on young people today? La Casa Norte, uh, uh, six years ago, started the first ever male intentional, male identified transitional housing program on, uh, in Chicago. Uh, and I say male identified because we're a strong LGBTQ ally with a strong trans uh, policy, but male identified because we wanted to make the opportunity to create stronger fathers, stronger brothers, stronger mentors in Chicago. Today, we're the largest provider of services to young people in the city of Chicago who are experiencing homelessness. We have a continuum of housing and services where young people can come in and experience that normalization and mentorship. And we're also the largest provider of services to Latino families. Again, creating opportunities for mothers, uh, heads of households, to uh, uh, engage in the safety net services that they need uh, to create strong families. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to wait. Oh, yeah. plus I can't listen to one more. Okay. I wasn't sure what you Okay. Um, so chill. <laughs> it was too much time. Um, I, I was working on um, It's very important to me to pronounce things. Correctly. So Chill uh, received her master's in international public service management from DePaul and is working as the operations and program manager for the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities. As a Peace Corps volunteer in small business development, she worked with artisan women and high school students in Benin, West Africa, and she has been involved with several immigrant advocacy organizations and previously worked as a policy and community organizing coordinator for the Resurrection Project. Please help me to welcome Sochi. And it's your choice if you stay or whatever you're most coming. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marco, for inviting me. Um, I graduated in 2008. Um, when this, uh, the public uh, school uh, service was, we just became a school. So um, I'm glad to see it thrown into, into this. So, um, so I work for NALAC, which is the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities. We're in the process of changing the name because it's pretty long. But um, we are it's a network of immigrant-led leaders. Uh, that convenes about 80 uh, immigrant organizations across the U.S. in about 15 states. And we come together to, um, to advocate for the, um, the needs of our communities in the U.S., like, like Soledad, the communities here in the, in the U.S., but also in the home countries of origin. So we do, um, we're considered a transnational organization because we do uh, advocacy work here and advocacy home in our home countries of origin. So, and we do this by articulating um, an, a collective agenda. So we get together um, and then we figure out what are the needs and what are the things that we're going to work for. Um, and then we also do build uh, capacity building and, and organizing. So a lot of our work, as you can imagine right now, is an immigration reform. So I'm going to do a little commercial. We're actually working on, at this point, a new campaign we just launched called um, the, um, the Power of the Pen. So we're asking uh, President Obama to use the executive power to stop deportation. So want more information? Talk to me after the presentation. So um, a lot of my personal work, um, so I'm the, we're, there's only four um, staff members within our coordinating team. So we have a lot of member organizations, but in, in our team it's only four of us. So my job is to do a lot of the membership engagement and um, mobilization and a lot of the hard work. So I get to go around and um, meet with people and, uh, and talk about and just try to see how to um, organize in the different um, localities of the yard. And so a lot of my job has to do with organizing the campaigns, uh, figuring out what, um, what, what um, the leadership uh, you know, needs they have, the capacity buildings, 
we do advocacy visits and sort of like what Phil was saying, you know, going to visits to DC and things like that, getting our our um, our members engaged in civic participation. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the challenges that we have. Um, I want to talk about the women that are part of our network because um, as as Laura said in the beginning, I think a lot of the women are not here, but I'm here. I'm here more to speak about what they go through. And, and you know, uh, we, and I'm, I'm going to say that I'm also an actor in this because I work in this environment myself. But it's mostly focused on the challenges and the opportunities that um, the people that I work with and that I represent go through on a daily basis. Because it's not, um, although we work for a social justice organization, we struggle with it within our own network. So I think. Um, in order to understand what's going on, it, like I was, I was saying earlier, we are a network of immigrant-led organizations. So a lot of our members come from uh, Mexico and Central America, and so uh, a lot of our organizations um, have a really uh, cultural heritage plays a big role, and that includes you know very positive things, but also you know we bring we bring with us a lot of the um, the baggage or cultural heritage that we that we come in. And it, including the perception of uh, gender roles, and so because of that, um, the role of, of submission in like home countries of origin, uh, we tend to replicate it here. And um, and although we have amazing women like Sol, like Sol, you guys saw her energy, and we have a lot of women like that as well within our network, um, but we still have a lot of work to do um, in in the, in the organization. So. Some of our challenges that we um, that some of our women go through, you know, are very similar to what many women go here. I mean, go through here. I think it's in a bigger scale, though, because I feel like um, when we talk about um, gender equality, uh, we struggle a lot with you know things like the salaries, certain types of jobs that go to men, um, and certain, and certain jobs are, are go to men, and certain jobs go to to women, and that goes with the, the high, higher paying jobs usually follow, tend to follow men, and uh, the lower paying jobs you know, tend to follow women. And um, a lot of the women that we work with in the community are so, um, a lot of them that work in the community have uh, the, the roles of the men tend to be those of authority and leadership, where uh, the roles of women tend to be more of a support or operations running around. So the, there's a lot of underrepresentation in public spaces. Uh, we um, we have, like I said, we have in our leadership women like Soledad, but it's it, we're still underrepresented. It's not it, we're not we're not even where we want to be. And the participation is actually even less sometimes because in a lot of our spaces it's a very male dominating um, circles. So when you have a Community events where people are, are talking. A lot of our women do not feel um, that they can speak, or they have uh, people are going to take them seriously. So, um, and I'm saying because this is a this is a conversation that I've had with them because we're trying to work within our membership um, to develop more leaders. So, I mean, as NALAC, we are some of the opportunities that I see is that um, it's a network and. I'm talking about the board and our staff. We're pretty committed to gender equality, and we've started doing um, more education um, on this on these issues. But um, there hasn't been like a, an aggressive and intentional agenda, um, like I think Marco said about integration. You know, making it intentional to change these these things, and. Um, there's conversations between the leaders to try to create a, a national caucus, and and it's going in that direction, but it hasn't happened. And I think the reason why is because everyone is so um, busy with their local stuff and with their local leadership that sometimes people work separately, right? So within a network, it hasn't really happened. It has we we haven't had the the um, hasn't happened yet. I think we're, we're aiming towards that. But where we come together and we start demanding our, our sort of like uh, our representations and making sure that we're leaders, that we're actually developing our leaders within our networks, um, because we are we do work for a social justice organization, and so we need to demand that from within. 
So um, we have a lot of you know talents in, in the organization, women. Um, I think Sol already talked about her story and the people that um, mentored her. We have a lot of women like that. We have women in the organization that have really strong backgrounds. Um, a lot of them left, you know, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, in countries that were, you know, were in war from El Salvador, Guatemala. So we have a lot of skills. These are women. They have a lot of skills organizing. They have, um, you know, they've been through a lot of different situations. So. They they become amazing people to follow. We just haven't really had the really the the time to come together. So um, I mean I think we're okay. So um, that's where we are. Uh, we're we're growing, and I think the organization uh, will evolve as you know as much as um, as we want it to. Thank you. Well, so is going away. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Maria Ferrara. Maria is an assistant professor here at DePaul in our, um, MSL, our Master's in Social Work program. She served for 12 years as an LCSW in the areas of child welfare and medical social work, and has done work in the Asian and Filipino American communities. Her research interests involve ethnic identity formation and cultural adaptation issues among immigrant families and ethnic minority youth health disparities, social justice, and utilizing mixed method approaches in social work research. And help me to welcome Maria to Thank you. And I apologize for have a cold, so I'll uh, talk as loud as I can foster. I want to thank uh, Greg and Liz for inviting me, uh, and Marco from this is the World Engagement Institute, so thank you. Um, a lot of the, my understanding about the dimensions of women uh, and empowerment has really come from my work and research with first and second generation immigrant young adults and youth. Um, a lot of it comes, a lot of my understanding comes from their individual narratives and stories. So a lot of my research um, really revolves around my curiosity about their unique experiences within their own <coughs> context. So I'm going to just highlight two um, young women that I've talked to in different um, areas of my research, particularly. And they, they really touch on the complexity of what it means, uh, this first one, as a second generation immigrant who must reconcile a lot of the sacrifices that her mother and her parents have made, um, and a lot of the freedoms that she has as a second generation or that her parents, her first generation immigrant <coughs> parents, did not have. The backdrop of her story and her she she named herself, she identified her own pseudonym, uh, Coco, endearingly <coughs> Coco. She's 22 years old, uh, or at least when I interviewed her. And in the study, I talked with a group of second-generation Filipino Americans um, to ask them how they've developed their ethnic identity. And what I was curious about, particularly the Filipino American community, is how this history of colonization may be influencing that identity development. So with Coco, this backdrop of this notion of colonial debt the sense of thankfulness to America for U.S. intervention, uh, for U.S. presence in the bases for colonization, um, is somewhat prevalent in their narrative, not only in Cocos, but for many of the second generationers. So this theme sort of underlies her sense of self and her sense of uh, being an ethnic individual. So she, as I was talking with her during the interview, we kind of talked about her parents, how she felt about her parents coming to America from the Philippines, um, which is a certainly a, a very developing, uh, impoverished country. <coughs> so they come, many of them come. There's 420,000 people on the wait list to come to the United States. 
So she, she says, referring to their migration, to her parents' migration, I think them coming here was the greatest thing they gave me and my sister. I would always tell people that if I grew up in the Philippines, I would probably be selling mangoes by the side of the road right now because there's no opportunity over there. All the overseas workers, like almost every Filipino, if you open the American borders, they would just get on a boat tonight and come right over now. It's hard over there, so I would not want to live over there. Now, given that she talks about this incredible indebtedness she has to her parents, she also talks a very, about a very internal struggle with herself and conflict about uh, questioning why are we so thankful to America and why am I idealizing uh, America and why am I so American? And she talked about feeling not not feeling truly Filipino, not having a strong ethnic identity. She talks about being an Oreo, being an Oreo, being brown on the outside, but very much white on the inside. Um, but what was remarkable in talking to her, like many of the other second generation young adults, is this sort of struggle and their, their process of questioning the dissonance, experiencing the conflict. And to me, that was evidence of a level of resilience, empowerment, the shifting, this thinking and questioning was a very quiet form of empowerment that raised their consciousness about a community that has experienced a historical trauma in their own community, in their own family, and how that history impacts her as an individual and how she questions that. Um, a second narrative that I have from a study that I'm doing now, and it's in partnership with the Coalition for <laughs> African, Arab, Asian, European, European, Latino immigrants of Illinois uh, and Central Central Terrorism, we're looking at new immigrant youth in this Youth Health Service Corps program that is building on social capital and empowerment of youth to promote health, increase health literacy and spread critical health information in their new immigrant communities, particularly with undocumented families who are not covered. Many of them are vulnerable because they're uninsured. And before I go on, I want to thank uh, Jarrell Shepard and Bernadette Velosky, who have been assisting me with this research. And I'm going to uh, speak from a transcript that Bernadette just, Bernadette just sent me. So I want to thank both of them. This 18-year-old uh, young Latina living in Pilsen, uh, I'm naming Anna, and she's undocumented, and she's a so-called dreamer, so she came to the United States at a very, very young age. Um, like Coco, she talked about a, a very deep sense of indebtedness to her mother, who is her main caregiver. She was the only one. And the sacrifices that she made for her as an immigrant. She talked about that burden of that responsibility. <laughs> and as a researcher, I can, I'm coming in, I'm trying to understand <clears throat> the, complex, the complexity of the experience of being undocumented. The fear of either oneself or the family <coughs> member being deported, loss of family members. Uh, loss of benefits, loss of access and resources. So one of the things I asked um, Anna is, what is it to, what is it for her? What does it mean to be a doctor um, in the context of being a student, wanting to go to college, wanting very much to go to college? And she said to me, "I am not afraid." I know that there's a lot of my peers who are also undocumented. And I, like they, they hold back, and they think that that's a barrier. And that's where they're going to stop. And because they don't have a social or social security number, 
uh, it really limits us a lot because we don't get financial aid, we don't get a job, but as a lot of my teachers, counselors, and everyone has told me, the, the laws are changing every day. And that shouldn't be our barrier. So that's why I kind of want to be an inspiration to them, to see that I'm still going. And there's been a lot of people who have been as successful as undocumented students. So they're my motivation as well. And at one point in our talk, in our interview, she referred to a shift in her own behavior, um, sort of coming out of a fear, those, those usual fears that are internalized when you're quietly marginalized as she is as a new immigrant. She took risks to engage in after school programming, to meet other people, um, and engage with uh, older adults who became her mentor. And she said at one point, I didn't know that I had so much potential within myself. And she's also said, now that I look back at it and I think about all the struggle, struggles and mistakes I've done in my life, I feel like I have been resilient because I've never given up and I'm still moving forward. So she described the process of meeting counselors and teachers, mentors within the program that she engaged in, and internalizing contradictory messages about herself that she can actually identify her own potential and actually strive for that potential. And she talked about someone talking to her about, you, you are a resilient person, and her being surprised about that and shifting towards a, a thought of maybe I am, and yes, I am. And she's part of a program where she takes advantage of college counseling, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, as well as these leadership, exposure to leadership training, uh, advocacy work, talking to legislators, going to Springfield in DC. She's taking advantage of this. And these are all forms for her of empowerment. So like Coco, um, Anna, and many other stories of immigrant youth, the quiet, the questioning, um, sitting with uh, inner conflict, um, the quality of persistence and risk-taking, that hardiness, these are the stories that help me to understand um, what it means to be empowered and what it means to be resilient. Thanks, Maria. More voices that we're bringing into the room. Very specifically there. Thank you. Alison Niebauer is our next speaker and um, the final one on our panel. She's a project manager with Maui Learning, an organization that equips students for success through non-cognitive skill development. Prior to working with Maui Learning, Allison managed the medical police department at a large refugee settlement agency. In addition to working with Maui Learning, she also coaches collegiate debate for her alma mater, Lee College. Are you going to speak up here? I am. Thank you. She's a powerful person. And now that you guys know that I am a debate coach, I will have less excuse for going over time. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. no but you shouldn't have to watch it. So, are you already going to go? Are you going to go? I just need to go up here. That's right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have, is yours already on for school? It's right there. It's right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all so much for having me having me today. As I as I was introduced, my name is Allison Niebauer, and I work for an organization um, called Maui Learning. We are an organization that seeks to empower young people through non-cognitive skill development. So our vision is to radically transform the academic and career opportunities of youth worldwide by dramatically increasing their non-cognitive skills. And we do this in three ways. We do this one, we are um, an industry leader in non-cognitive skill building curriculum. Secondly, we partner with schools and organizations to actually train educators how to um, teach non-cognitive skill development. 
And lastly, we host a conference every year. Actually, it's held um, downtown Chicago every summer in which we um, bring together passionate educators to talk about non-cognitive skill development and to give them the tools to bring back into their organizations, nonprofits, and schools. So to give you a little bit more background, Maui, um, Maui Learning is not named after Maui the island. It's actually named after Maui Askadon, who's our founder. Maui was an Ethiopian refugee who came to the United States and was resettled right outside of Chicago. And Maui's own personal story of overcoming tremendous adversity to succeed um, led him to just develop a passion for helping students succeed, particularly students who face obstacles to learning. And um, with this passion, he looked specifically at what factors influence student success beyond that of academic success. And it was this passion that led him to look at the field of what we in Illinois called social emotional learning, but for the rest of the night, what I'm going to call non-cognitive skill development, and how non-cognitive skill development can really drive student success. So I've used it about five times now, so I suppose it's time to define it. So the question is, what is non-cognitive skill development? So I'm going to go over a couple things. I'm going to go over what is what are non-cognitive skills, what role do they play in education, and how they can help students achieve. So when I'm referring to non-cognitive skills, I'm referring to the skills, strategies, and behaviors that impact students' attitudes, motivation, and performance, and ultimately undergird student success. So let me give you a couple of examples of these. And I, I choose these categories because these are actually categories that were developed by our own um, Chicago Consortium on School Learning, who did an exhaustive literature survey and decided that these five categories, academic perseverance, academic behaviors, social skills, learning strategies, and academic mindsets, that these are the five categories that best house non-cognitive skills. And once again, these are the skills, strategies, and behaviors that impact students' attitudes, motivation, performance, and ultimately undergird student success. So I'd like to put a little bit of uh, actual teeth on this by giving you an example of a student and what non-cognitive skills look like in the life of a student or in the life of a young person. So for this particular student profile, she is a rising high school freshman. She has average grades, but they're slipping to a C or C minus. And she has, in her nationalized um, testing, she's scoring pretty low. She's scoring at 255 out of about a 600 on her math score. So she's going, scoring pretty low on the standardized math. And so for a lot of organizations and schools, this is the picture that they get of students. They get, um, they get this picture. They get the profile. We see the uh, implications of something that's going on. She's not succeeding academically. But we're not asking the question, why isn't she succeeding academically? And how can we help her? And of course, maybe we could give her more homework. We could set her up with a tutor. We could um, you know, intervene and, and put her in remedial class. But before we do that, we need to ask ourselves, what attitudes, skills, and behaviors has she learned and internalized about herself that have brought her to this point. Because after all, she is going to be employing those same attitudes and behaviors and skills when you put her in remedial math as she is in regular math. So let's look at a couple of those uh, underlying beliefs. First of all, we find out that she believes that she is just not that good at school. This is an example of a non-cognitive mindset. It's a mindset that she has about herself. She believes she's not that good at school. Secondly, we find out that she has trouble completing assignments when they get difficult. This is an example of an um, underdeveloped academic perseverance. She struggles to overcome barriers when, they get, when it gets really tough. We also find out that while she has a lot of friends among her peer group, she has struggled to diversify her network. She has struggled to make friends outside of her immediate surroundings. And this is an example of someone who is struggling to develop her social skills which is also a non-cognitive skill. And lastly, we find out that she wants to have a good job and make money, because don't we all? But she doesn't have the goals or the, specifically a plan on how to do this. And this is an example of uh, actually a metacognitive strategy known as a learning strategy. She knows what she wants kind of vaguely, but she hasn't learned how to set goals for herself or any of the strategies that are going to, um, that are going to be needed to help her meet her goals. So what does this mean? What this means is that because she hasn't developed the academic mindset, she is going to have a really hard time and tend to give up when things get hard. 
because she hasn't learned to persevere academically, she is going to struggle to turn in assignments, which means she's going to get zeros in, in classes, probably fail classes, and ultimately at, at times fail entire courses or entire school years. Because she's failed to develop her social skills, this particular non-cognitive strategy, she's going to be more subject to peer pressure and at, at, at risk for more risky behaviors. And lastly, because she hasn't learned the metacognitive strategies that she needs to set goals and follow through with them, she isn't going to see the connection between what happens right now in school and what she wants to do later in life, which means it's going to be an up, uphill battle to get where she wants to go in the future. And this ultimately is the ball game. When we don't address what's going on underneath the surface, it's really hard to address academic achievement issues. So that's why non-cognitive skills are incredibly important. And one of the things I wanted to talk about here within this forum is why non-cognitive skills are so incredibly important for women, and particularly when we look at the gap within uh, STEM areas, but particularly within mathematics. And this is true across academic uh, disciplines, but I think it's the most clear in math, which is why I would like to use this. And I'd like to look at particularly the non-cognitive mindset. So this is a category called mindsets. So a leading researcher in non-cognitive skill development, particularly in academic mindsets, Carol Dweck, did a study of fifth grade students and found that when confronted with confusion over new material in math, bright young women were more likely to do poorly than bright young men. In fact, the higher the girl's IQ, the worse she did. And this was actually the opposite of boys, where the higher the IQ, the better they did. So of course, Dr. Dweck and her research team asked themselves why. What they found out in subsequent studies was that it was not a difference in ability at all, but a difference in how students coped with the experience that called their abilities into questions, and that women were more susceptible to a loss of confidence and effectiveness when they ran into difficulty. So her team then asked themselves, what do we do about it? They decided to look into the root cause of this vulnerability and found that it originated in students' beliefs about their own intellectual ability. Some students viewed it as a gift, something you either had or you didn't have. And some viewed it as something you could develop. And these beliefs dictated the academic success in almost every subject starting in junior high, and actually dictated whether or not students would maintain their interest in learning throughout junior high. In fact, in a two-year study they did, they found that students who believed the intellectual ability could be developed earned significantly higher grades than their counterparts who believed it was a gift. When looking at the gender story, they found that by the end of eighth grade, there's a large gap between boys and girls in math grades, but only for those students who believe that intellectual skills are a gift. When they looked at students who believe it was a thing to be developed, the gap disappeared. This is incredible. And Dr. Dweck and her research team decided to do an eight-week intervention to see whether or not this could actually, they could actually change mindsets of, of women who believed that it was a gift. So they designed an eight-week program for junior high students that taught them an idea that intellectual beliefs could be developed. They also created a control group that received an eight-week program in high-quality math instruction, but they were not taught about how intellectual skills can be developed. After the program, the group that received the growing message earned significantly higher math grades than the control group. The most striking fact was that the gender difference, while very large to begin with, disappeared between, in both math grades and math test scores. So in this example, and in a lot of other research examples as well, and in the examples I'm going to show with our own curriculum, non-cognitive skills is the ballgame. Non-cognitive skills is what influences success and is incredibly important for women when looking at empowering women both in, academic, in the academic world but long-term for long-term success as well. So how do we at Maui learn to do that? Well, we create an innovative online curriculum that captures students' interests and maximizes blended learning. Another interesting fact is that women are more likely to engage in academics in a virtual environment than they are in a classroom setting, meaning this is a really, really neat avenue for women to participate in non-cognitive skill building. Our courses cover all of the five um, subjects that we, or five areas that we mentioned before. And we actually partner with organizations, schools in the Chicago area and nonprofits in the Chicago area, but also uh, worldwide, to help students develop these non-cognitive skills. And we support organizations who are looking for more training in this area as well. And we have um, what we have found is that for both of our programs, particularly for our leadership skills curriculum, 
it has shown dramatic academic gains for students who participate in it. So for in this particular example, this was a CPS school who used our one of our programs. They found that A's within the students taking the class went up by 28% compared to their counterparts. And decrease and failing grades decreased by 60% compared to their counterparts. But I think the most important thing is that students actually reported that they felt that their skills increased and felt that their success increased. Because what that indicates to me is that students aren't going to just have short-term academic success. They're actually internalizing the mindsets they are going to need to apply them in the long run. So if this is something that interests you, as you can tell, I can talk in nauseam about non-cognitive skills. I think they're really great. And I'd love to share more information with you. Um, here's my contact information. I'd also be happy to give you one of my cards afterwards. We also have a conference, as I mentioned, in the Chicago area um, this summer. So if it's a, an area of interest for you, I encourage you. Um, we have invitations on the way out that look like this, but also I'd be happy to give one to you. So thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. So you've heard a variety of different perspectives and voices, both the voices here and the voices that these speakers, including Marco. Marco, are you going to stay there? OK. He's intimidated by all this. So um, all, of, all of the voices tonight, and then the voices that they've strived to bring into the room. And, the voice, uh, and we have people not even in the room here. So um, can you all hear us right back there? OK. Well, feel free to come sit on the floor in here instead of out there. Um, or we can bring chairs in now that we're going to have a conversation. Do you want to, like, scooch in here? You can come sit in here against the wall. Do you want to come in? Feel free. We're very casual here, informal. Just come on in. It's fine. If you'd rather, you can come bring in chairs along the wall here if you want. Or, you know, you don't have to sit on the floor here. No, all right, thank you. Okay, but feel free to, like, drag in a chair. No one will think you're there. Um, so now is your chance to have your voice heard as well, or to ask questions. So we'd welcome any questions that you have of any of our speakers. You could even ask Sol, and we can pretend to speak for her, since we're perfectly willing to speak for other people. Um, so I welcome questions. Uh, yes. I have a question for Pamela Mayer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was really interested in Luca mm -hmm. method, but how did you really use that in women empowerment? Because I was a little unclear about mm -hmm. that, but I kind of felt like you kind of use make people realize their capacity or capabilities. But how did you really use that in women empowerment? Yes. And actually, if you can expand on that, um, and, and if, if we can repeat the questions when you're here, because sometimes the people back in the hallway might not be able to hear. But um, if you could expand and talk about how um, your process uh, work towards inclusion. I thought mm -hmm. maybe you could expand sure. the question a little bit. Yes, and so so as I mentioned at the start, my, my work is not specifically gender focused, but one of the things I, I saw in my research was, and, and over many years working with uh, teaching improvisation, but also, and I, and I teach it not in a performance context, but use improvisation as a doorway to, for people to get more connected to their own creative process, to find their own voice. And so what I saw across genders, but it was particularly striking with women, was uh, people who describe themselves, and it, it very much, I think, tracks with, with your research and, and other people's work around self-concept and, and mindset, that people came in with a certain mindset, and especially women, that um, I, had, I had one woman who was middle-aged, and, and she, um, she said, you know, I'm not creative. And as it turned out, that that stemmed from, she had an uncle that told her she was too fat to dance. And she carried that. So she, she thought, I can't dance. I, I would embarrass the family, she was told. And, and that mindset, that early message was something that then she found evidence to recreate again and again until she was in a safe space in which she got positive feedback and where she had room to experience her own voice. And, and the woman who, whose quote I shared, very similar experience, though it wasn't, she wasn't identifying it to any specific um, moment or feedback, but 
that once she had that defining night, and this was a rare, I'm not saying that people just tend to have these epiphanies and suddenly, you know, the clouds barred and, and they experience creativity, but, but after that defining night, she started writing about, she worked in a law firm, and she said, you know, I'm starting to speak up, I'm cracking jokes with my coworkers, she was a big, um, uh, very religious person, and she said, I'm starting to testify spontaneously in church, and she then at some point joined Toastmasters, that some of you are familiar with, it's a, a, a voluntary speaking group to, for people to build their speaking skills. By the time I came back to her three months later to interview her, she was the president of the chapter of the Toastmasters <laughs> group she had joined. And, and so it's, it's such a great story in a, in, a small, um, in, a, in a small example of what can happen when we intentionally create context for voices to be heard, and there was a lot of intentionality, but it was it was not overly self-conscious. It was simply we're all we're all agreeing that we're all at risk here. We're all in a vulnerable space. We're going to be asked to do some silly things. We're we're going to support each other, and many of you have experienced this in your own learning environments. Um, and this also relates to some some research that I've been reviewing on key points in executives. Uh, learning over over the years, and the in the most interesting thing that that stood out to me was way more than content of any formal learning. Executives report that the value of learning or significant learning experiences in their career was not content, skills, and knowledge, but the confidence that they created by living through a particularly challenging experience, or the confidence they they developed in an executive training program, and I think that tracks very much with the non-cognitive skill set and the, and the mindsets that we're talking about. So when people experience inclusion, they start to experience that their voice, not only do they have a voice, but it's a valued voice. It one, it's one that can be creative, it can be funny, it can be one that they can start experimenting with, that um, some pretty significant things start to happen. Other questions? While you're thinking, um, one of the things um, on Pamela's note, you might have seen the Pantene commercial recently where men and women are in business environments and they look out the window or they're in the midst of things and the man looks out the window and sees a word, it might be boss, and then the woman looks out the window and she sees the word and it says bossy. And then the man looks out the window and it says proud, and the woman looks out the window and it morphs into pig-headed. Mm -hmm. And so it's how men and women see the same messages, but they're told different things from these messages. And Pantene is trying to say, no, you know, we need to change this. And um, it's the way that marketing um, speaks to women and men differently and gives us different messages. And so if we can change those messages, then we change the mindsets and we can have greater inclusion and greater. Yes. Um, this question is for Professor Lee. I forgot your name. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I forgot your name. Um, Sochil. Sochil. So so oh, okay, sorry. Um, you find it to be like more challenging working with um, immigrants or, um, or compared to like um, Western women trying to break that mold of empowering women and have to deal with the cultural aspect and then being second generation of finding like more challenging to try to empower them to break through that mold because of the different components and barriers maybe us being like the US. That's actually a very good question. Um, because I think of that I think about my uh, peaceful experience a lot when I'm working Oh I'm sorry. She said if I find it uh, if, the, if I find the same challenges, right? Yeah, would it be more challenging working with, um, uh, I don't know if that's the right, you know, working with, like, for second generation or first generation. Okay, so she's saying if um, I find it more challenging working with immigrant um, women here, um, the, the population I work with here, which is immigrant um, women of uh, Latin American descent or working with women in of in, uh, in Africa, right? And so I worked as, as a Peace Corps volunteer. I worked with um, in West Africa in Benin, and I actually worked with uh, women that actually had very similar um, challenges. And, I, and every time I I'm, I'm working with you know with um, with my uh, 
colleagues here, I, I think a lot about the struggles of African women too, because it brings me back to my my Peace Corps experience because we, I realized that the struggle within for women is not just within like one uh, one place. I think we go through it. It's an I mean it's a it's a I would say an international or global issue. So I mean it's different because. Um, Maybe certain cultural aspects, but at, at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same oppression. Um, you know, many women are not allowed to. I mean, very few women in the town I lived were leaders, and so um, it was also very difficult to to speak up. And a lot of the women that in the society where I lived in Benin, a lot of them were, um, um, you know, second wives of men. So they were, they were allowed to, they weren't really allowed to do a lot of the, the work or, I, I don't think it was there at the level of advocacy at that point. So I think it depends on um, the challenges of, of, uh, of um, advocacy and where we are, like the type of work that, I, that I'm doing here versus the work that we were doing in Benin. It was, it was different, but um, the struggles are pretty much the same. Maria, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's a very interesting question, and I think um, so many different responses for each group, I imagine, because I think for a lot of um, <coughs> ethnic, Asian, very collectivist cultures where it's very family-oriented, there's these underlying uh, ingrained values in uh, sort of submission, not being assertive, uh, sort of going with the flow, uh, and being passive. I know with, in Filipino culture, there's an interesting duality because Filipino women, there's the uh, stereotype of um, Filipino women being prostitutes, being part of the sex trade. But there's also this sort of uh, Maria Clara figure that's virtuous, that's very you know, the country is very Catholic. So I think it's an interesting uh, dynamic to see first generation Filipinos sort of embody uh, the Mary Clara figure and then the second generation Filipino Americans who are very Americanized and being a, in, in cultural psychology, they say the more Americanized you are, the more at risk you are because it represents more at risk behavior, more um, sort of Sex, sexual promiscuity. So there's a certain, it's an interesting dynamic intergenerationally uh, when it comes to the female perspective of the Filipino American communities. And it's, it's uh, I'd be curious to see how that compares with different ethnic groups. Um, Allison, is there, I would be curious based on <coughs> some of these answers. Um, as to whether you notice any cultural differences. You talked about gender differences, but um, when you talk about girls, I assume, you're, when you're dealing with young women and their learning differences, are there cultural differences across gender as well? Because in some cultures, girls are supposed to take a second, a, a backseat role to boys and not speak up or not be a leader. And so one of the comments that you made was that, um, you know, even when girls know the answers and things like that, they might not speak up. So do you notice cultural differences with young girls as well? You know, that's a really interesting question. And there is some, some research out there, particularly on the intersectionality um, and what it looks like for different cultures, um, particularly uh, women from different cultures to interact within uh, within a school setting and, and to interact um, with their peers. And there definitely is significant different differences from cultures um, on how students interact in schools. It, it is interesting to note, too, that a lot of the concepts that we're talking about are rooted in um, rooted in, in, in Western thought only in how we're taught. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily translate as well um, in every single culture. Although what I will say is that every single culture has 
words to describe what we're talking about, but it looks different in, in everyone's culture. Um, for example, we have a uh, one, one of the courses that we have is called Super ELL, and it's actually it was created out of um, our founder's love for ELL students and for um, his heart being a former ELL student and English language learner student. And for that particular course, we're teaching non-cognitive skills. But before we do teach academic perseverance and academic mindset, we actually teach a course, uh, teach a module on how to understand, value, and identify differences in communication within cultures. So we talk about openness versus closeness in um, communication. And we actually find that this is a necessary component of teaching non-cognitive skills cross-culturally, because not all of the things that we're talking about are going to have the same, um, same place in the value hierarchy. And not all of them are going to be concepts that are going to be able to be embraced in the same way, although they, they are found in, um, in most of the cultures that we work with. I can go on and just ask, and I can just talk to these women. I think they're interested, but I want to make sure that I'm Yes. I just wanted to share a personal experience. We had a group of all girls at the high school. And um, to kind of what you were saying, I feel when I look back in hindsight, most of the people that participated not only in the classroom but in extracurricular activities were white American girls. As a, as we had, I was in San Diego, so about probably more than a quarter of my school was living in Chicago, and then there was also other races as well. But from my personal experience, most of the, the more active students were white Americans. And, and I don't, we all felt very encouraged to, um, in the learning environment, but just after you asked that question, maybe you think about that. You know, the experience I had was that those girls, um, I don't know if they felt like less judgment. I don't know what it was, and, but it just, you know, it was true that. The but there's America. a power. I mean, I think there's something around power. And think about the schools in which you each were raised. And so whether it's your grammar school or your high school. And then compare it, you know, many of you have a DePaul experience, then not all, you know, of you in the room, you might not. But DePaul, I think, strives to be somewhat different. And you can say, no, it's not. <laughs> or maybe it is. It's it's one of the most diverse schools in the country, but we might not be successful beyond the way it looks. But think about um, the voices that you hear in the classroom in each of those environments. And then who participates, and who plays sports, and who's on the newspaper, and who's on the yearbook, and you know who are those participants. And then what does that mean for the people who then graduate and go, you know, or who go to the interviews, or who's the sportscaster, or who's the weather person, or who goes to college, you know, for those decisions. So who are the voices that prevail? You know, and who's encouraged to go be a strong voice? And who's told you can do anything? And who then grows up believing they can do anything, right? So, you know, I think we should get to, I have a question for Maria first, but I think we should get to, and I'd like you all to consider, what now? Like, great, okay, so that's what happened, past tense. But now, now what? We're talking about women empowerment. So what can each of us do with the voices we've heard and the information we've taken in tonight <coughs> to impact our environment, the work that we each do, and even if you're a student, you do work every day. So what can you do with the interactions you have to allow people, meaning women you're around, and then other people who are not women, to allow a space for women's voices to be heard? But um, Maria, I had a question for you before we get to that more active, um, what can people do? Um, you talked about this thankfulness and gratitude, you know, to their parents or to whoever it was that created this entry. And you said, well, if not, you know, I could be selling mangoes on some street in, in wherever, Nicaragua or whatever it was, in the Philippines. And I have experience in Haiti, right? So, um, so I think about the Haitians who now live in Miami, which is where a lot of Haitians go. But they don't have such great life in Miami. So I think about the people whom you interviewed, and they are so grateful. But the immigrants that that um, you or Tocho 
you know, experience and, and interact with. I wonder if some of the people whom you interview think, okay, great, you know, they open this door that I'm here, but my life here isn't so so hot. And they there's also some resentment, and maybe if I were back there, I could do better. Is there any sense for women in particular that if they were back there, they could do better than being here? I don't, I don't know. Or is America still the land of opportunity for immigrant women? My, uh, what drove my study was second generation Filipino Americans was there is a high depression rate for second generation folks who are, notably, who are middle class assimilated to their more Americanized, okay. which is interesting. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of studies that crack open the reasons why, but the, the individuals that I interviewed, um, many, uh, of them, if not at all, talked about this sort of longing to go back to be more Filipino because they're Filipinos, they've been colonized, we speak English, we assimilate well, we blend in well, they navigate Western, the Western world really well. Um, but then their parents sort of leave this, they, they don't depart the family, but they depart the culture that's very impoverished and not particularly proud of, so they they settle here. And their definitions of success is here. So they're not investing a lot of energy to retain culture and stories outside of their family. They're tight-knit um, cohesion as a family. So a lot of the second generations are, I wish I was more from, you know, I wish... They don't talk about going back socioeconomically. I mean, they, they understand that their opportunities are here, and they feel very better. They want to succeed in the professional. Um, they want to to give back to their parents, but they, they do long for that ethnic identity, which I think you're referring to. And is that your experience as well, Sasha? Well, I mean, one of the reasons why Milaka <coughs> was formed was because they had deeply rooted um, connections in the country of origin. I mean, we're the only transnational advocacy of immigrants in the U.S. that actually um, is part of networks in, in Latin America and as immigrant leaders. So, I mean, they're very um, attached to the home and the country. And many of them, like I said earlier, they come from countries where they had to leave because there was war. And they had to leave, you know, I mean, it wasn't something that they chose to do. So a lot of our, our message when we talk about immigration or migration, we talk about the root causes of it. And we, they, and we think it's important because people were pushed out. And a lot of the policies also are policies that this country you know, has also been part of. So I think uh, the immigrants, and, and I include myself, I'm born in Chicago, but I'm I'm raised in, in Mexico, and I, got, I came here as an immigrant child, so I, I kind of can um, assimilate to what they're also what they're feeling. But it's this sort of like a love and hate relationship, you know. It's kind of like realizing that yeah, we have all these great opportunities here, yet um, we're not really welcome. You know? There's like anti-immigrant uh, laws across the U.S. We have to be fighting, you know, these whole things, the, the whole campaign that we're doing on these deportations, it's not very, I mean, it's, it's for a reason. So I, I feel like people are, like, they, they want to belong, but it's, it's also like, um, <coughs> when you're not wanted or you're not, you know, sort of welcome here, it's, it's, it's hard to. And then also the fact that, yeah, I think people always think about going back, I think, in, in their heads, but I, it's more of an ideal thing. I think that when people do go back, it's not the same thing, people have changed. You know, so it's more an identity, and it helps yeah. to define who they are. And I think that as immigrant leaders, they feel good about participating in, in advocacy efforts at home. And that, it's funny because actually, in in the home countries of origin, they're like, "What are these? What are they doing here? They don't belong here. What? Why do they come and talk about issues here?" But it's like these are people that left their country. That they have the one. They're the the ones that should be talking because they went through the whole process. They were pushed out. So. Yes. 
I've, I've heard a lot of the you ladies talk about this um, idea of submission and submissive women are cultures where women are really acculturated to be more submissive. And I'm relating this to supporting Somali refugees in Tokyo, being refugees here in Chicago, who are very much, uh, I would say, falling within that category. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak of some of the pragmatic ways that you've worked with women or submissive roles to how you can help empower women in a way where it's uh, not threatening to a family <coughs> structure or threatening to the, the community structure, so it can be more accepted. <laughs> That's always a tough question because look, we um we have leadership development uh, projects. It's actually pretty pretty cool. We uh we use popular education techniques. Um, we're based on um, so if you know a little bit of popular education, it's based on uh, actually uh, it's a very participatory type of of, of uh, learning, and it's also. Um, Bringing in the knowledge from from the people, so it's not like you're you know you're telling them, or they're actually they're telling you. And so we do a lot of these public education techniques that uh, actually work very well within within our membership. As far as like, um, it's tough to to not like rock the boat or get or get people upset because what you're doing is you're pretty much changing them their mindset, right? Disrupting. So you're disrupting the family. And so what happens in like. Um, in some of our communities, if you're, if you're working with women, you have to be careful on how you go about doing this, especially because in, 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 in their home, their husband's going to start noticing that. Maybe, you know, they start questioning certain things, or maybe they're spending, I mean, the, the, way, the ways of thinking and the way they start seeing the world is starts shifting. So it's going to be disruptive. It's just, I think it's a matter of um, being pace and um, and just doing it little by little. So, I, I teach at the School for New Learning, where all of our all of our adults are, all of our students are age 24 or older, and our median age is in the in the 30s. And and this sense of disruption is a, is a, is a big thing that um, many of our adults experience, and especially women that that we've seen that um, that that uh, there is a sense of threat, not not just in the family structure, but sometimes. Your, your peer group, as, as people start changing, becoming more empowered. And, and one of the things we do early on is help people identify what are the barriers, who, what is your support system, what are, you, what are your goals, what obstacles do you perceive with some of your goals so that, um, that, that we don't paint it as some rose-covered rose -covered path, that, that there will be things that, that you'll encounter and how can you bring those peers and family members in as partners and help them understand, so creating more experiences for them to be involved in the process along the way um, and, and perhaps be a partner to you rather than somehow feel like their comfort zone is being completely threatened. But it is uncomfortable and it is, as you say, Laura, disruptive that, that um, learning and change are, are disruptive and threatening. So I don't know that there's a way to necessarily make that comfortable because it is uh, certainly is part of the process. But inclusion is yeah. bringing them into the conversation so they're not mm -hmm. Exactly. I think that is being intentional about that is key. Marco seems to want to participate. Yeah, because uh, we asked actually a similar question in a study that we did with some colleagues in Minnesota regarding uh, Somalia women empowerment. And we were facing a, a variety of, uh, of challenges, obviously, dealing with uh, Islamic society with a lot of uh, issues on gender, lack of uh, possibility, etc. And uh, first of all, we analyzed that empowerment, women empowerment, had to work synchronically at three levels. One is the micro level, the interpersonal, the, maybe also the psychological element that we have heard before. The second level is uh, it's kind of a, a, a meso level, an organizational level, it has to do with community, also relation, the intra. And the third level that is kind of systemic, the macro level. You know? And if those things are not to work somehow, obviously not that everyone has to do everything, but in partnerships. Because as we have seen in some cases, even particularly in Islamic countries, there is all these uh, women empowerment organizations coming from Europe, from the United States, and they go there, they say, oh, you have to change, and now you have power. 
Yeah, right. And then it turns out to be like a lot of uh, actually honor killing that uh, there have been uh, had numerous rising episodes of that. So you need to create the structure that also create the possibility of those rights, those women's rights, <laughs> to be exemplified and also the, uh, protected in many ways. That's why I think the importance of collaboration between organizations uh, and also at various levels, at the government level, enforcement level and so forth is very, very important for women in parliament. It's not just a storytelling, it's not just a, a mindset. That's certainly important. It's a critical element because culture is an important element, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. You also, if you can show models of success of environments where it has been successful and you know, modern society has not imploded, you know, so that you can show that there's been success, that others in that culture have still retained their roles, and that women have joined, not taken over, but joined the, the, the power environment, um, but, but within a similar culture, that then it becomes less threatening. Um, I think that the threat is perceived as that you know, the women will replace the, mm -hmm. the people in power. And instead, it's that they will join and be collaborative, as Mark was suggesting, so that if you can demonstrate, look, this is what's happened in your neighbor, and, and so you know, perhaps we can create something here and allow all voices to be heard, not to be replaced. Oh, Greg, you had a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think then it's an excellent you. question, uh, because in my oh. opinion, and I've expressed it before in smaller groupings, even the phrase women's empowerment is a bit overworked and misunderstood. That's why I like to talk about strengthening families. And what Saul had said that La Casa Norte is doing, or has done, has been to start a, a men's strengthening club, mm -hmm. a, a young men's club or a boys' club. I think that's but the answer has to be in that context as well. Marco, like you were saying, in terms of uh, empowering women and helping girls access education, it's striking in Pakistan, again, an Islamic country, where, especially in religious time, there's a concerted effort on the part of government there, and it's not hidden, to keep girls out of schools. So what the international community has done has been, through the World Food Program and other international organizations, actually award girls students who go to school and faithfully attend uh, extra rations of cooking oil or food so that they bring that home to the family to replace the view of parents, especially the father or the brothers, that the girl's role is keeping the kitchen clean. And by accessing this additional food, which these families need, it is a, a really good tool on that context. Now, if we think about that within our own Chicago context, it goes back to what I was saying a moment ago that Seoul had addressed in her agency by strengthening men and not singling out women per se. And that's where, again, I come to the conclusion of we need to talk about strengthening the entire family and helping all elements understand this so that if a Western African man who uh, has his third wife and is not averse to being a little harsh in the way he administers um, the um, uh, way to bring up children, especially the girls, he needs to be reminded by the case managers and by the agencies that serve them the importance of, of being more sensitive to laws. So I went on to that. No, I think that your your whole concept of ensuring that I think that when we talk about women's empowerment, we're really talking about people empowerment. And it's just women have not been considered in the same role of dignity as men for a long time. So we try to we're sort of doing the affirmative action concept. And so we're focusing just on women. But really, we have to focus on everyone and make sure that everyone feels heard. And we can't err on the side of women and allow the men to feel unheard. And so we need to make, otherwise, then it will just boomerang. And, and we need to make sure that everyone's voice is heard and treat men in the same way we're going to treat women. So I think your, your concept is important. Um, you had a comment in the back, right behind this. Yeah, I was actually going to say pretty much the exact same thing. Um, You're just as smart as you. add on, I guess, <laughs> add on a question um, to the panel of anyone, and especially Allison. Um, I was really interested in the non-cognitive skill set, but 
whether any of you have worked in women's empowerment with actually changing the non cognitive skills or mindset of men instead of just solely with women um, towards the women's empowerment. Because I've been doing more research, like Greg said, about um, not just targeting men instead of women, but in a, in a way, I wonder if anyone has a comment of whether you think it's even more important maybe to focus on men's mindsets than women's mindsets, since they are the ones in power. Most of these cultures that affect the business of women and maybe if that's equally or more important than focus on women. It's a really important question. Allison, do you want to take that first? I would absolutely love to take that question because I think that it's so important, um, as Greg said, to focus holistically on families, which of course include um, working on men, or <coughs> working with men for men's empowerment. And I think an awesome example I can think of that's actually local to our area is an organization called Boys to Men. It's an organization that Maui Learning has partnered with, um, founded, uh, founded and headed by Clayton Mohammed. It's out in Aurora, Illinois. And about, um, Gosh, it has to be about 10 years back now. There was a, a spate of killings in Aurora, um, gang-related violence and, and killings. And um, the, school, the school system, in particular, was looking at how can we have a systemic response to violence breaking out in our community. And one of the educators there, Clayton Mohammed, decided to found a club called Boys to Men. And this club, um, oh, they have a hilarious model. Let me think I. Think, think if I can even say it. It has something to do with like um, defining what men are. Men are people who treat people with dignity, who um, dress well, walk better, and then they say all men are created equally. Some just dress better and have more swagger, or something like that. It's, it's really awesome, but it's an organization that actually is dedicated to creating strong, positive male role models. And they do this through a lot of the non-cognitive um, non-cognitive skill building that we're talking about. Um, particularly when we look at social skills and how social skills relates to um, your interpersonal skills, your ability to value diversity and to see it as an asset instead of a threat, to really um, communicate to others with respect, to really act with um, integrity and to have leadership skills. And the amazing thing I think about this program, and the reason I bring it up and I hope that you guys look into it, is because not only did it have a tremendous impact on the community, and to this rate, 100% of the graduates of Boys to Men either go to college or go into the military, but specifically, it has had a replicating force. There is now Boys to Men charters, not only across the country, there's actually a Boys to Men charter in Australia. It's amazing, and I think that's what empowerment does. It replicates. That when people see this happening in young people and other people, they want to be a part of it. And so what male empowerment meant in Aurora was that it replicated to the surrounding areas. It influenced the culture of not only men, but also women. They now have a sorority, uh, what do they call themselves? They're like the um, diamonds in the rough, I think. And they're the, the women's sorority that's a, a women's empowerment chapter. And so I think that's what it does, it, it replicates. And I think it's vital that we focus on all aspects of empowerment. I'll just say, I think something that can can get um, lost when we get to gender focus is we can create these bifurcations around gender. And, and when we talk about strengthening families, we can sometimes forget that not everybody is, is heterosexual and, and that our families can look lots of different ways. And I. I know Sol left when she was talking about um, the LGBT people that she works with, and so I'd be, I'd be interested in, you know, being sure that when we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about all of the different ways the systems look for for all of us and for each other, and um, and especially that becomes challenging in, in some of the <coughs> international context right now. Any other questions? Yes. This is one from men. Um, after being welcome from uh, another country, I feel like even the word women empowerment, it's a little rough on certain cultures, and it might come out like a Western country. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in, in some organizations trying to you know, go without, they don't really understand that, and they try to enforce that and it comes up as a Western 
intervention and that breaks the cultural barriers. I mean, there's certain cultures, a lot of people I think, or people from Somalia, women from Somalia, Ethiopia, they're like, you know, culturally the women are submissive, but actually they have capabilities. Like sometimes Muslim women are controlled with their sons and even their uh, decisions about their marriage. So I think people have this misunderstanding. Even working with refugees here, like, you just have to be very careful with your wording, how culturally sensitive they are. And I also done sexual education in Minnesota. And um, the, when I was teaching these uh, young girls and boys, there was one particular school they decided to teach them separate without having them in the other white <laughs> people. Um, so first I thought this is really interesting because I never seen they change the boys and girls separately or teach no, people teach of color separately. Well, Somali students separate. Uh -huh. So in the other classes, usually Somali students they don't really speak that much or ask me questions, but when they were separate and they actually asked me a lot of questions. And um, and we even have like these uh, papers, they can write things anonymously. And they actually have this ability, you just have to find out how to. And just if we look at them like, OK, these women are somebody, or these women are like that, and we have to do you know, something, give this new idea. I don't think that's actually going to work if you don't work together with their culture. Th that's my thought, but I feel like there's a disconnection. But I feel like whether they're Muslim or <coughs> any religion or any culture, this, they have their own way of empowerment inside them. I, I, I think that that's a really valuable comment, and that your experience with the Somali women, at the end you said it's, it's any culture, it's that each culture has its own vocabulary and cultural interpretation. And whether it's it's Somali or Indian or Haitian or any culture, you'd have to interpret it and get to know it and be in solidarity with that culture in order to understand how to allow that voice to emerge. And it might be gender-based. It might be age-based. Sometimes individuals in certain cultures are not com comfortable speaking because the senior people need to speak, the older people, yeah. and they don't want to um, have people think that they don't know, you know, because it, when you ask a question, it means that you don't know something. A question shows ignorance, and so people don't like to display that they don't know something. So understanding that separating cultures might allow their voice to be heard rather than create some separation that we have at least in the United States, we don't like to separate yeah, cultures. First I was surprised so that they did that, you know, separate. And I was like, well, I but that's imposing our filter. We don't yeah. like to separate because that creates exclusion. Yeah, like if I said, it. OK, all the people of color, you go in that room, <laughs> you think that was horrible, right? And so, um, and I'll just give one example of something that I use in class that often shocks people. But, you know, um, there was a, a case that a man brought against his child's school. And he said that the teacher in the grammar school was causing exclusion because she welcomed her children each day saying good afternoon or good morning, boys and girls. And they said, oh my gosh, that's horrible. It's in a grammar school because it's, it's reinforcing our gender distinctions. <laughs> and people normally would giggle and say, oh, be serious. This is horrible. And I, and I will often introduce the case and say, okay, you all think that's no big deal. And, you know, we just, we always say, huh? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Global Cafe. And did it, it's normal, right? I'm sorry, I just can't see everyone. Um, so, um, so the case progressed, and and I said to my students, I, I said it progressed because what if I said, "Hello, Jews and Christians," right? That doesn't feel so right. Or what if I say, "Hello, blacks and whites, and and other people of color. You know, you Asians, you Muslims, you know, you whatever's out there. Like that doesn't feel right, right? I mean, that in our culture, we don't kind of draw attention to that. But we think it's OK to say, hello, girls and boys, or as the case said, and I'm sorry, Erica, hello, people with vaginas and penises, right? So <laughs> the dad in this case said, it's about as bad as that, right? So you know, he said that it's causing that much awareness of their genders. And why do we do that? 
there's no reason to say, hello, people in here who are male and female. Why do we always do that? And then you remember as you were growing up that you were, you know, okay, let's do a chart. How many girls, you know, or sit, girl, boy, girl, boy. And we're always reminding people that we're different. Why don't we remind ourselves of how similar we are? Because we like to do that with the races, right? Oh, you know, let's combine everyone. We're all the same, right? We don't like to say, okay, let's separate by race. Okay, that feels really yucky. And it's really uncomfortable even to talk about it right now, right? We don't like to create awareness that we look different, right? That's not something we should talk about. So um, we don't like to do that, but we think it's okay still to do it by gender. So why is it not okay with one, but it's okay with another? And to unpack, and we won't do it right now because I have a question waiting, um, but we, why is it okay? And then unpack, what's not okay about doing it with race, religion, or could all the gays raise their hands, please? Right? So it's not okay even with sexual orientation right now. But then it's okay to say, excuse me, men, could you let the women go first? That's more polite, right? It, it, like, why do we distinguish based on men and women? And we still do. But it's not okay to do it based on other things. And which parts of that are all right with us and which aren't? Okay. Um, you had a question. Oh, yeah. My question is for Allison. Uh, when talking to teachers, how would you encourage them to be able to um, get kids to not feel like they're out of school? So, it's a good question. And there is so much interesting research behind it. And if you're interested, I will, I will actually set you up with this article, because the article asked that same that, that particular question. Um, and from that article, there's two examples that I'd love to bring up. The first, um, and, and this was also, there was kind of the it book in education two years ago um, called The Optimistic Child by um, Martin Sigelman, I think. And it basically talked about how we um, create fixed mindsets, so the mindset that, that our abilities are fixed, versus a growth mindset, uh, the belief that abilities can grow with your effort and with your um, taking small steps. And one of the things that this particular book, The Optimistic Child, uh, brought out, and the, the study does as well, is that our habit of praising people based on fixed attributes can lead people to feel that those are cemented, that they are basically a zero-sum game. So if we spend our whole life saying, oh, you're so smart, or oh, you're so good at math, it can actually lead uh, in, 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 a particular, um, in a particular environment for people not to feel good at math, but to feel like they have to be good at math. And that if every time they get a, make a mistake in math, that that reflects on their ability in math. And so then they become more hesitant to try and make mistakes, which means that they're less likely to push through difficulties, and they really stagnant in their growth. So I think that's been one, a, a real eye-opener for research in non-cognitive skill development, how we talk about ability. Um, do we talk about it as, hey, I really appreciate that you tried really hard. I really appreciate it. I saw you growing in that area, versus, oh, you're so smart. Um, the second thing that this particular study did, which I found so interesting, was even the way we teach concepts um, and we talk about people who develop concepts. So in a particular intervention that Dr. Dweck did, she had a, a group of eighth graders. She loves to do them on eighth graders because, you know, it's just such a great period of life for all of us. And um, <laughs> she taught this geometry class, and she was teaching it about a particular really difficult concept in geometry, but about the uh, the minds behind it, the, the men who had, and women who had actually come up with this concept. And in one class, she taught it from the perspective of, oh, these men were geniuses, they were so good at math, they just had this brilliant like mind wave and came up with this concept. And then in the other class, she taught it from the perspective of, these were average Joes who worked their butts off. And the interesting thing about these two classes was after the class, she gave the set of students a difficult math concept based on the lesson. And what she found was that students, particularly, she's looking at the uh, women within the group who have this fixed mindset. 
the women in that group who had the fixed mindset about math in the group that were taught that these <coughs> men were geniuses and that's how they came up with these math concepts, they did very poorly on the math problem. She contrasted it with the women who were taught that these were average shows who worked really hard and they were actually shown significant ability within this and were actually able to, um, to wrestle and, con and, and conquer this concept in this, <coughs> at the same rate as their male counterparts which is, I think, a really interesting uh, word of advisement for how we look at our own pedagogical, if anyone's interested in going into teaching, how we look at our own ped pedagogical styles, about how we communicate beliefs about abilities. So my clock says we have time for like one quick question, depending on if that's something that I'd like to get answered. Yes, Kim. Yes. Um, Thank you. I, I wanted to kind of go back to what you were saying before, Laura, about uh, separation versus not separation. I think it was you, Allison, who mentioned the online learning. And I just wanted to say that's a really interesting um, place to sort of, you know, look at all different kinds of interactions. And I, I, I have an anecdote. I did kind of an unintentional experiment. Um, I used to go to Bahrain in person to teach my class. And I went there a couple of times. And this is not necessarily a gender issue, because the women in Bahrain generally spoke up in class. <laughs> But, um, and then the, the last time I taught the class, I um, kind of at the last minute had to do it online. And there, I, and what I noticed about the online class is that there were a few controversies that come up in the field that I was teaching. And when I was there in person, we didn't discuss those controversies very much. Like the students didn't discuss them. But online, they really got into some deep discussions and um, uh, disagreed with each other, I think, a lot more than they did in person. So I just thought it was really interesting about how that opened up a voice for a lot of people, not necessarily gender, but just people. And, and to me, that, that comes back to the spaces we create for, and I think you were talking about this too in, in your experience, that if, if there's that sense of safety, we still want the, the challenge, but if, if we can figure out or, or co-create safety in whatever cultural setting, whether it's an organizational setting, a cultural setting, that, and also not be afraid of provoking each other, but we can't have the provocation without the safety. It's a great example. We, uh, I, I teach online as well. I hate it, by the way. Um, <laughs> Marco teaches online. He's OK. But I, I hate it. That's and part of my view of online teaching, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and I think I hate it because I appreciate the accountability of face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I, I want to draw people out. I want people to feel like they can speak. And I want to encourage voices. Plus, I call them, like I cold call. So like if a woman's in front of me and she hasn't spoken, I'm like, no, you. You with the brown sweatshirt, speak to me. And I just don't let people <laughs> sit there saying, so what do you think of tonight? No, I won't. <laughs> um, so I'll ask you afterwards. Um, so I'd like to leave you. I hope you enjoyed and learned as much as I, I did. And I'm ready to like go teach tomorrow and, and you know give credit where credit's due. But go bring all these ideas. I teach ethics, so it's perfect. Um, but I, I, I really hope that you gained as much as I did. And um, I think that the benefit and that what we can think about and what I hope you might take home is that we come together and we come together as a group so that perhaps um, maybe we can give strength to other women so they can stand alone as individuals. And um, so it's really important to have these conversations so that we can help voices um, be heard and help other women and people, humans, throughout the world to um, feel stronger so that their voices can be heard on their own. So I'm very grateful for you coming here to help us come together. Thank you all very much. And thank you. No. No? Right. Well, stay tuned on the Google Plus page and you'll hear more. Thank you all for your participation. <laughs> Thank you.